In the late 80s, I, uh, as a divorced woman, I was nursing a broken heart. It was a sad divorce. I, you know, we, uh, we thought we would be together forever. It didn't work out, but we had two great kids out of the union. I felt very sad and alone. After my divorce, I thought, oh, I have to find somebody, I have to find somebody. But then I realized it just wasn't going to work out that way. So I more or less resigned myself to the fact that I was going to concentrate on my children, my job. And what I would do, I would travel a little bit. That would be my thing. I let go of that dream because it didn't seem possible at that point. I mean, I was in my 30s and um, it just didn't seem like it was in the cards for me. I asked a lot of people that traveled, if you could go any place, you know, where would you go and what was your favorite place? And I heard again and again, Greece. So I said, you know, that's where I'm going to have to go. It sounds good. Made plans to go with a girlfriend. About a week before the trip, my friend canceled on me. And I was emotionally, I, I felt like I had to go. And a friend of mine that's psychic, very nice Christian lady, she told me, she said, you know, St. Michael is with you. And I said, St. Michael? And she goes, yes, yeah, St. Michael, I can see his sword. He's with you. He's helping you cut through all the changes in your life. And you have nothing but bright and shining roads ahead of you. So I said, well, that's nice, but I put it out of my mind. I had some Greek friends who introduced me to a Greek travel agent in Rhodes, and I heard about going to Simi Island. I looked into it, and there was a little tourist boat that went. I signed up. As the boat was pulling into that, probably the most idyllic harbor you could possibly see in Greece. A lot of the women and young girls, they're going to the bow of the boat and their husbands, boyfriends, whatever, taking pictures of them. There was an Italian couple that bef befriended me and he said, you go up to the bow of the boat and I'll take your picture with your camera. I said, okay. Well, it was interesting. Unlike the other people, very, you know, hurried, rush, rush with all their camera shots, he took his time. And as he took his time, I was able to relax on the bow of the boat. And I, I said to myself, God, let me show in this picture how happy I am. And I'm by myself. And it was quite a moment, being a woman, to be able to say it and believe it. So I relaxed, and this beautiful picture was taken. And I didn't think anything more of it. Well, that same day, we got back on the boat and went around to the monastery on the other side of the island. As we walked into that tiny chapel in the monastery, not knowing what to expect, it was very dark. And in the corner, floor to ceiling, was a silver icon of St. Michael. I, it took my breath away because immediately I remembered what that woman had told me about St. Michael protecting me and helping me with the changes in my life. I was spellbound and across St. Michael's chest was a, a chain or a rope and thousands and thousands of dollars of gold jewelry was tied on to it. There was another wooden box filled with icons of all kinds. There was an icon of an eye, an arm, a leg, a child and I noticed this icon of a man. I said, hmm. So I took this icon, it had a little ribbon on it, and I tied it over St. Michael's heart. I made sure it was over his heart. And I said, God, I said, please send me my partner, somebody we get along with in mind, body, and soul. And I knew, I knew that when you ask for God for something, it's already yours. So I said, thank you, God. And I tied it on and I walked out of the monastery and didn't say a word to anybody. When I got home from Greece, I couldn't wait to develop my film. There was pictures I was really interested in. Oddly enough, I didn't really think about that picture too much. I was more interested in a picture of a little boy uh, on that same Simi Island where we were playing peekaboo, and I would say, Ella, Ella, and he would 
he would go up and down and under this bow, this beautifully new-built blue boat. That was the picture I was looking for. But as I developed all my 22 rolls of film, this picture of me on Simi Island, pulling into Simi Island, was just so beautiful. I said, boy, I think I'm going to have my Christmas cards made with that picture. I, and I wanted to be a real upbeat message, and I said, happy holidays and go for it. Several weeks after getting back from Greece, I had to go to the travel agent. It was the same travel agent that made arrangements for the Greek trip. And they noticed that I had my planner opened as I was looking at my calendar, and I had that one more Christmas card taken of me on the boat pulling into Simi Island. Just one more right there. And they said, oh, let me see that. And she looked at it and said, oh, this is beautiful. You're going to have to give it to my husband. He'll be so proud, he'll put it on his credenza. And I almost didn't want to let that picture go because it was my last card. And I thought, well, okay. And I gave it to her. About a week later, a man named Bill walks in their office and wants to know who that woman is. They've been friends with Bill a long time. And in an effort to protect their customer, me, they said, oh, she's a nice girl. You don't need to be calling her or anything. And he said, no. He says, you tell her that I want to talk to her. And so they, they called me and mentioned that this young man was, wanted to talk to me. And I said, well, yeah. You know, I'd been single a while, so I just let it go. A couple weeks later, I get another phone call. You know, you really should talk to Bill. And I said, well, whatever. I get a call from another Greek friend who I'd found a house for. He said, you know, you have to get this bill off my back. And I said, give me his number. Well, I hear this really nice voice on the other end of the line. And he said, who is this? And I said, well, you're going to have to guess who this is. And he asked for a few hints, but right away he figured it out. He says, the girl in the picture. I says, that's right. And he says, I have to meet you right away. And I, I said, well, I'm busy. And he said, well, what about tomorrow night? I said, I have a date. He goes, break it. So I said, I can't do that. He says, well, what time is your date? And I said, seven. He says, meet me at five. Well, I met him at five, never made the other date, never made another date after that. And we've been together ever since since 1989. We got married in the Greek church. I wanted to honor his Greek heritage and we know that we're meant for one another. And even if we have a bad time, we remember how we met and that God put us together. So we always try to be kind and nice and, and grateful for the opportunity we have for each other. I just feel that angels are with us, our guardian angels, and I was lucky enough to get the biggie for a while. Before we can understand or talk about the archangel Michael, we have to have an understanding of what, what are angels in general. Well, an angel in the church's eyes is a messenger of God, angelos kirio, a messenger of the Lord. They are known as the bodiless realities the bodiless forms, form without a body. They are real, they influence us, they serve us, they help us, and yet none of them, it is very interesting to note, has the ability to discern or to make judgments like man does. Man is a higher being. God, through Jesus Christ, teaches us than even the angels themselves. The Orthodox Church definitely believes in angels. Angels are fundamental, first of all, to our worship because the whole liturgy is modeled, in my opinion, on the vision of uh, the prophet Isaiah when he was called to become a prophet. He had the vision of the throne room of God and he, he was called up there and he saw the angels, the cherubim with their six wings. The angel came with the charcoal and touched his lips to purify his mouth. As I had said, Woe is me because I am a man of unclean lips. And how could I dare to serve God? But the, he was cleansed, he was purged by the charcoal. So the charcoal being uh, touching his lips is a prototype of the Holy Communion, 
uh, our church established belief in angels really in the Council of Laodicea, which was a council that actually met prior to the first ecumenical council. It was a local council in Asia Minor, and it was really to uh, address a heresy that was arising in that region uh, in which the people were beginning to worship angels. And the church recognized this as not being proper and wanted to define what the proper place or the proper veneration for angels would be in our beliefs. And based on what St. Paul had said, they restored angels to the proper place in our understanding, that is, as a created being. We do not worship angels. Uh, we worship only the Lord Jesus Christ and angels are his messengers. I wonder if the angel in life could be that person who shows up at the most unpredictable time, unexpected, who comes and puts a hand on your shoulder, who comes at a time when your finances are right down to the bottom, when you're newly married and you're not sure you can make the mortgage payment or the rental payment, and some stranger out of the blue who says he knows a cousin of yours says, I have a, an envelope I want to give you. And sure enough, in that envelope, there's enough money for the month's rent, and you wonder, who is that person? Nobody's ever heard of him. So angels sometimes take the form of people who are around us. Let's not look so high up into the heavens to see wings, when we ought to be looking closer to us and finding angels in our midst. who could be just individuals who, reminds us, who remind us that God does love us. There are many biblical examples of angels and the existence of angels. And probably the earliest is in the Old Testament where Abraham and Sarah are visited by the three angels in the Old Testament. And because they were somehow mysterious and there were three of them, the church has always interpreted this as a prototype of the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as a proof to us that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit always existed that there was not a time when the Father existed and the rest of the Son and the Holy Spirit did not exist, but they were all of the same essence and always one God. And in fact, within the uh, iconographic tradition of the Church, this is the only canonical way in which the Holy Trinity can be depicted. And it's a beautiful icon. It's entitled The Hospitality of Abraham. And there you see Abraham with, with the, three, the three angels. We see in the beginning of Christ's ministry, we see when after he is, he is tempted, 40 days is fasting in the wilderness, and the three times, one after the other, that Satan tempts him. And we see right after that, after the third time when Satan is defeated by our Lord, Jesus is ministered by angel. Actually, one of the key places, two key places in the scriptures where angels play a very clear role is on the 25th of March when we celebrate the Annunciation of Theotokos. The archangel Gabriel comes and announces to Mary that she will give birth to a son and her son will be the Lord Jesus Christ. He will be the Messiah, uh, the one who has come to save the world. In the Garden of Gethsemane, in that moment where in his human agony, being both God and man, Jesus for a brief moment there in his agony of contemplating what was about to happen on the cross, said, Father, if this cup could only be taken from me, but not my will be done, thy will be done. And God, if he wanted to, could have taken it, but what did he do? He didn't take the cup away from him, but he sent an angel down to him. And the angel gave him the strength to be able to uh, persevere, to be able to um, embrace whatever life has in store for, or had in store for him. Uh, the other place that's extremely important uh, is at the resurrection of Christ, when the women come and they find the tomb empty, there is an angel there who says to them, he is not here, he is risen. See the place where they've laid him. And of course, um, that's the fundamental announcement. That's the fundamental, um, that's the beginning of Christianity with the resurrection. In our faith, we do believe in guardian angels. We believe that there is an angel for each individual. During the baptism of a child, there is a prayer that's read and it's at the back of the church. And during that time, it's when we're renouncing Satan. It's right before we actually do the issue of spitting upon Satan and turning to Christ. There's a prayer that's read from the bondage of the enemy. Will you receive him into your heavenly kingdom? How beautiful. Open the eyes of his understanding that the light of your gospel may enlighten him. And here's the spot. Wed him in life to a radiant angel to safeguard him from every plot of the adversary from every evil encounter, from the destruction that wastes at noonday, and from evil visions. So, very much so, 
we're called to have the light of Christ within us, to dwell in his word, to lead us and guide us. And on top of that, we are wedded to a radiant angel to safeguard us. Powerful. The important thing is that we are never left unguarded, that especially in the, in the innocence of our infancy, in our early years, when we need to be secure and to be guarded uh, from various evils, from various things that may come against us, God certainly provides through his guardian angels protection for us through, the enti through our entire life. And it's interesting uh, that some people ask if we do have guardian angels, then why is it that so many bad things happen to, to good people? And there's a misunderstanding here. Uh, we do have guardian angels. Every human being born has one or many guardian angels. But we can't think of our guardian angels as bodyguards. They are guardians, and they are spiritual guardians. Well, for us as human beings, in order to grow, whether we like it or not, we have to suffer. <laughs> That's part of life. And we can't forget that we worship a crucified Lord. Angels cannot be seen as a hovering, mothering sort of influence protecting us from every bruise and every calamity in life. I think part of developing into who we actually become as human beings, spiritual and otherwise, is to go through some of the bumps and grinds in life, to uh, suffer the disappointments in life, the pains, the illnesses, to suffer loss, uh, to suffer moments where you feel totally isolated but what angels do instead of preventing that suffering and isolating us and making us neutralizing any effect in our growth i think angels bring comfort we don't question necessarily why bad things happen that's a reality christ told us so but what did he say in this world you have tribulation but be of good cheer i've overcome the world there's a line which actually in the book of psalms is actually a reference to god but it says, shelter us beneath the shelter of your wings. And that's what angels do for us as God's messengers. They shelter us. Um, it doesn't mean that we won't suffer. But we have someone who loves us. We have God's care being expressed towards us. We have wings under which we can find shelter. I used to be a chaplain in a children's hospital years ago here in California. And I used to deal with children who uh, often uh, died of cancer and other dread diseases and I would be in the room with them uh, hours before they died or even at the moment of their death and they would always see someone dressed in white they would look right through us and they would call them their buddy or their friend and they would talk to them and as I would notice families weeping at the a few last few moments a child would have it was the children that comforted the parents saying no, 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 Mom, don't cry for me. I have a friend there. See that? See my buddy there dressed in white who's coming to take me? Don't worry, I'm fine. So I think that is really sort of the role of angels. Uh, for some, they're buddies. For some, they're that invisible presence. But above all, all of this is glued and kept together by the fact that God is in control. So it is to God that we address our prayers. And he's the one who sends this extraordinary help in the form of angels. When it comes to relating to guardian angels or to angels themselves, human beings rarely have an idea of what to do, how to do it. There's nothing in scripture that says address your angel. All of our prayers are addressed to the Lord. We ask God for the assistance and for the protection of our guardian angels and our angels. Jesus certainly believed that angels existed. Uh, when the soldiers were coming to arrest him and Peter drew the sword, he told Peter to stop. Don't you think that right now, if I wanted to, I can invoke the Father and he would send me legions of angels. And it's very symbolic that he would say, send me legions of angels, because what has now begun is not just a simple physical capture of Jesus Christ. What has really become intensified now is the spiritual warfare. The devil knows that Jesus Christ will be dying soon and descending into his territory. So we're now talking about the intensification of the spiritual warfare. And that's why Jesus would symbolically say, I can now invoke legions of angels for this spiritual battle but not right now uh, let it be as it should be so most definitely christ believed in angels he created them believed in them they ministered to him and continue to minister to him there is a difference between the presence of christ in our life and the presence of angels and if i can just drop this analogy for you um, when you're ill and you're being cared for 
that produces a certain feeling. When you're ill and become cured, that's a totally different feeling. The angels provide the comfort. Christ provides the healing. Christ provides the salvation. And there's a dramatic difference. Christ's presence is totally different. He comes to us sacramentally in confession. When you go to confession to a priest, you feel that burden lifted. That's Christ who takes that burden away. You feel his presence. You feel the presence of the Lord when you receive communion. No angel can replace that presence. Well, I think one of the things that's important for people to know is that there are ranks. There is a hierarchy of angels in heaven. In the spiritual world, there are nine orders of angels. We have the angels, archangels, thrones, principalities, powers, authorities, dominions, cherubim and seraphim. And the nine orders each have their own functions, but they're hovering, they're circulating, they're with the altar of God, but they're also protecting and shielding and involved in spiritual warfare throughout, not just at the altar of God, but throughout creation. It is God himself who puts the angelic order as the order of heaven. It is hierarchical. Certain angels have more important positions, others have less important positions. Just like the hierarchical nature of the church, this is a basic theological basis for the order of Christianity and the way the church functions. But the key here is, is not to memorize these names and to know where this, that in heaven, as heaven is in our midst in the person of Christ in the church, there is order. That everything has its place and all in that kingdom have their responsibilities and duties and that there is no chaos. Chaos is only associated with the dark side, with hell, with Satan. Where there's chaos, there is disorder, and there is Satan. Where there's order, where there's balance, where there's beauty, where there is truth, where there is an angelic presence, there is the order of the universe. There used to be a tenth order, and that's the order that Lucifer belonged to. At the time, Lucifer was the most beautiful, most glorious of all of God's angels, and, his, and he was his leader. Lucifer, though, seeks not to serve God, would become God himself. There's a book I read called by John Milton called The Paradise Lost, and it's a very profound statement that Satan makes um, in that book. He said, I'd rather be the king of hell than a servant in heaven. And this great surge of pride that came into him caused him to fall out of the heavenly ranks and with him all of the other angels began to fall so the whole order that was with him this tenth order began to fall out of the heavens and it was the archangel michael who realized what was going on and cried out let us stand with fear let us stand in awe stormen kalo stormen metaphorvu and brought all of the other angelic powers to their senses to realize the danger of their pride and that they would all be falling out of heaven so that's why when he said, stop, and the other angels came to themselves, for example, that's one reason why people named Stamati celebrate their name day with the archangel Michael on uh, November 8th. He was the one who brought all of them to their senses so that not all of the angels fell. So there was this huge revolt in heaven, and Michael and the other good angels um, were the ones who combated Lucifer and the evil angels. As far as a spiritual battle, uh, the battle of the angels, the fall of Lucifer, that battle uh, is unimaginable. Number one, we're talking about the spiritual realm, not the physical realm. We know how gory the physical realm can get. Those who have fought in wars, those who have seen others die, know how bad it can get here on earth. But when we're talking with pure spirits, it's simply something unimaginable. As Michael is battling Lucifer, Satan, he keeps yelling, who is like God? And interestingly enough, Michael's very name means, who is like the Lord, in response really to Satan, who said, I think I can be like the Lord. Michael's very name means, who is like the Lord. And of course, the answer is, none is like the Lord. He conquers Satan. He defeats Satan. And he sends him and his legions of rebellious angels into the abyss, into Hades, into hell, in the bottomless pit of fire. The consequence was that, in some sense, humanity was created later, mankind, and in a way, we take the place of that order that fell out of heaven. 
And that's why the demons are so determined to destroy us, because they're especially jealous that we seem to have taken their place. And it's a battle that goes on to this day. Yes, Lucifer was expelled from heaven, he and his forces, but that battle, that spiritual battle, between the darkness and the light, good and evil, exists to this day. It's the unseen warfare. Now the question to me arises, well, why did God entrust so much to the Archangel Michael? Um, I wish I had an answer for that. I can only say that God gives to each of us that which he knows we could bear and be faithful to. What's particularly interesting is that not only that God chose Michael, and that Michael was the archangel for this position, but that the archangels are in one of the lowest, are in actually the lowest of the three hierarchs. So by choosing Michael, it's, it reminds us that each of us has a position that is entrusted to us by God. And that there are times in life when we are called upon to fulfill that position. And some fulfill it faithfully, and some do not fulfill it faithfully. And perhaps uh, that's wherein the mystery lies. He knew that Michael would be faithful uh, to his every command. Michael wouldn't give in to the lie that ultimately Lucifer would. And so don't be surprised when he comes knocking at the door of your heart to give you a, me a message and to make you one of his messengers. So why he chose Michael? Because in his wisdom, he knew that Michael would be able to carry this out. And in his wisdom, he knows that you can carry something out for him too. And you just have to open your heart to that. Ton uranion stration archistratii Dis opumeni masi misi anaxim In atesimon deisesi tichisete imas Skepitom terigon Prospectondas, <laughs> 